Welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today, we're ecstatic to have with us a global leader, a visionary, and a luminary, Peggy Polonis, the president of ACS Athens. Peggy, welcome. Hello, George, and thank you. Thank you for inviting me once again. Live from Athens, Greece, I'm sure the Parthenon is not that far from where you're sitting right now. And gosh, to think a few thousand years ago, folks were talking about important issues like democracy. And now we lead into what will be an incredibly powerful panel talking about the empowerment of women and girls. Peggy, why is this issue so important to you? Such an important conversation, George. And obviously, it, this is something that involves both men and women because young girls everywhere need to know that they can break that uh, glass ceiling and the sky's the limit. And there's so much that can be done out there. That's right. And so, Peggy, we're excited. We're ecstatic. We're thrilled to hear from you leading up this incredible panel. We look forward to all of the incredible inspiration as we convene global leaders and luminaries to highlight the importance and awareness of the global goals, especially during this 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Take it away, Peggy. Thank you, George. Thank you. And I just want to begin by introducing our fabulous panel and thanking everyone for being with us today. I'm going to start with Aya Burwella, who is an entrepreneur, and uh, she's founded Code on the Road, who seeks to implement and promote a holistic approach to solving today's labor market and civil society deficits in both Europe and the Middle East region through targeted programs aimed at increasing labor market integration, entrepreneurship, and resilience to extremist ideologies that often exploit the downtrodden, insecure, and unemployed. Welcome, Aya. Welcome on the panel. Hi, Peggy. It's nice to be here. Good to see you. I'm going to move on to Natalia Linos, Dr. Natalia Linos, who is a social epidemiologist and the executive director of Harvard's F FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. She recently ran to represent Massachusetts' 4th Congressional District seat, and Natalia brought a much-needed voice for science and equity to the race. Dr. Linos previously spent a decade with the United Nations and was science advisor to the New York City Health Commissioner. She's a three-time Harvard graduate, and I'm proud to say an ACS Athens alum. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me, Peggy. Carla Tanis, entrepreneur also. Uh, uh, she is the founder of Future Argo Challenge, a global platform that focuses on innovation from farm to fork, by integrating all cultures to fix the complex food system and empowering farmers as the caretakers of our earth. Future Agro Challenge has a presence in 64 countries and all five continents. They build dialogue and act as a convener to find the best revolutionary and feasible solutions that can be held up high for the world to see that there are other ways. These solutions are brought forward to industry experts, policymakers, private sector, and media to help shape the complex food chain system. And their purpose here is to unlock new and natural capabilities to eliminate putting strain on Earth's soils and oceans or human and animal health. Welcome, Carla. Thank you, Dr. Colonis, for having me here. And Bonnie Miller. Professor Bonnie Miller has extensive international experience in clinical social work, teaching, training, and public service. She's devoted her five-decade career to providing mental health services, training professionals, and advocating for disadvantaged women and children. Welcome, Bonnie. Thank you, Peggy. It's a pleasure to be here. And Ariel White. I'm going to introduce Ariel just as she has asked me to, a proud daughter of a Greek immigrant to the US and an African-American father who grew up on a farm in America's deep south. <laughs> Ariel was born in the United States, but she's also an ACS Athens uh, graduate uh, alum. She went on to attend the University of Edinburgh 
where she was one of two students, originally 12, to complete a combined degree in law and politics. Ariel is a corporate finance lawyer specializing in equity capital markets, corporate governance, and public company representation. Um, if she currently sits on the Women's Lawyer Division of the Law Society of England and Wales and serves as chair of the advisory board of the LED Curriculum, a non-for-profit organization which provides leadership training programs to students for underprivileged backgrounds. She's a passionate advocate and mentor for women and black lawyers, a firm believer in the shine theory. When you help others rise, we shine. So welcome everybody to this wonderful panel talking about empowering young women and um, in relation to the uh, sustainable development goal, uh, gender equality. I wanna start with Aya. And Aya, just uh, the, the questions that I have for you is the empowerment of women and girls through education, social integration, and through employment and entrepreneurship. How does Code of the Road is empower, empowering uh, migrant women and girls through business entrepreneurship and software training program. What made you decide to tackle this subject? How did you get into the industry? Tell us about you. Uh, so where to begin? Um, so I'm a firm believer in uh, empowering women in practical ways. And I think one of the most practical ways we can truly empower women and put them in a position where they're best able to uh, defend their human rights and to progress in life is uh, to integrate them in the labor market, uh, help them be employable, uh, help them be uh, business owners. And one of the reasons I focus on this is also to prepare women uh, for the future labor market, which is tech oriented uh, and uh, industry oriented. And one of the reasons about behind Code on the Road, the inspiration uh, behind Code on the Road, I was speaking with my uh, one of my best friends in Jordan and we were talking uh, and he brought to my attention that there was uh, Libyan refugees uh, in Jordan uh, who were struggling. And that came as a surprise to me. Uh, usually uh, when we talk about refugees, uh, uh, we don't hear about Libyan refugees at all, uh, despite the fact that since 2011, the country uh, has been in deep uh, turmoil and civil wars, uh, which is ongoing today. And that disturbed me very much, uh, especially since uh, I think one of our, our, our goals is to give voice to the voiceless. So it started from that conversation and we thought to ourselves, what can we do? And I wanted to help. Uh, I was an analyst before and, and I don't think it's enough just to think. It's uh, think and do is my motto. So we got together and uh, we built a team. Uh, we created a proposal uh, for a competition uh, by the US State Department. Uh, for alumni of uh, U.S. State Department programs. And we wanted to be practical and we wanted to be different. It was an innovation program. And so how are we going to be in innovative? And we decided that uh, the innovative way we can help women is to deliver uh, tech uh, education and business entrepreneurship education uh, to women via mobile phones uh, and workshops. And why business entrepreneurship? Uh, Here's another uh, motivation. I was at a uh, head of research and policy at uh, a huge NGO uh, here in Greece prior. And so I got to look at the field, um, uh, get an idea of what the field was like. And over and over again, I'd see a lot of programs for women uh, and they focused on teaching women um, uh, skills such as cooking, sewing, uh, stuff like that, which is absolutely fine. But I felt that that was uh, lowering expectations. I feel that uh, uh, I feel that uh, in this today's world, uh, today's world of tech, we can definitely teach women not just how to be good employees or enter the labor market, but if you're really good at what you do and you're passionate about what you do, to be business owners too. And that is something a mentality, I think. And I think this might address other questions. Uh, this is a mentality uh, that I feel uh, women aren't exposed to. Uh, we're not taught, if we're good at what to do, to be your own boss, uh, to be your own business owner, uh, not to just be an employee. So this uh, this was a huge motivation. I, I got sick of uh, women, my, and I found that a bit, um, not prejudiced, but I found that there was the kind of like a low expectation uh, that we can only teach migrants 
or women certain certain tasks that we 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 are not teaching them how to uh, best take uh, advantage of all opportunities our modern society has. So that's why we're really really focused on on tech. Uh, we want to be as practical as possible and uh, give them the skills for the future. Uh, and is there any other question that I might have missed out on? Yeah, I, I, I'm wondering what is it practically that helps you get where you are today? And oh. you know, how, how would you advise other women that would like to do something similar? Um, practically, I want to mention uh, how important mentorship is. How important, uh, uh, and studies have shown that women have less access to mentorship uh, than men do, and that is not surprising. Uh, mentors play a huge role uh, when you're young, and I think I had really nice, and just to, just to, I think it's important to, to give credit where credit is, is due. In ACS, I had uh, wonderful teachers, and I specifically like to uh, mention Ms. Grenars, our history teacher, who not only taught us critical thinking, but was also a wonderful mentor. And it starts from young. And I think uh, a lot of women miss mentorship, and we don't have a mentality to ask for mentor mentorship, to, to ask for help, to ask for advice. Uh, the best thing you can do is understand that you don't know everything, and there are people who know more than you. Uh, mm -hmm. To ask them, to mentor them, so I had really good mentors every step of the way. Uh, and this is, this is really important in life to attract like-minded people. Uh, I think in the real world, you're gonna have allies and you're gonna have enemies and you're gonna have saboteurs. Women need to know how to navigate these things, find their allies, uh, build a great team. Uh, you can't do anything alone. Uh, so uh, I think that helped me a lot. And also knowing what you want, uh, knowing uh, to be driven, at all costs. Uh, knowing what you want uh, and having a vision of what you want, I think, keeps you on track uh, to successes and obstacles. Mm -hmm. I, uh, what do you think is the greatest barrier to um, female leadership? Uh, I think we're going to go through all the, uh, so many barriers to female leadership. I think one of the biggest barriers to female leadership is the obstacles we place in our minds. Many times we don't even uh, dream that far uh, for this position to become leaders. Uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an obstacle in our heads too and our education system and that needs to change. And of course, barriers, we have to be specific about barriers to female leadership. Are we talking about barriers to female leadership in the West? Are we talking about uh, barriers to female leadership in Asia, Africa? Which communities? I think in different communities there are different barriers that, that are uh, the different seriousness. Uh, but definitely, I think uh, in certain parts of the world, uh, in North Africa, in Africa, I think there needs to be more social emphasis on education. Nothing is more empowering to any human being, male or female, uh, more than education. So access to education. Mm -hmm. and you talk about places where, you know, uh, females don't necessarily have these opportunities and bringing these opportunities to them. And I want to move over to Natalia, who actually, you know, is in an, in an environment where there are all these opportunities. And she certainly has had these opportunities. Now, Natalia, you led the, the United Nations Development Program's work on climate and health, where you partnered with your leaders, including young women. What role are female youth leaders like Greta Thornburg playing in the fight against climate change? I mean, Greta and other young leaders are playing a tremendous role. And it has been truly impressive to see youth, uh, we're talking about 11-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 18-year-olds, holding governments accountable. And that this perspective that they bring as young leaders, that it's intersectional. They recognize that climate change is the you know crisis of their generation, but that it is overlaid with issues of racism, issues of economic exclusion, poverty, and they want us to figure it out and they want us to lead on this. So young women have been at the forefront of the climate movement. And I want to acknowledge Greta, but also, you know, there's young women in Kenya and Fiji and young women in Latin America across the globe who are stepping up. And I had the privilege at the United Nations to meet with many of them. I also want to acknowledge that young women in their homes, you know, there's one study in the United States that says that the most effective, persuasive sort of um, 
person to convince a Republican male to take climate change seriously are girls, their daughters between the ages of 11 and 14. You know, there is a lot of power of persuasion that can happen at home, at the international scene and at the national scene. And I think it's important to also acknowledge though, that these women are facing uh, harassment. You know, even President Trump uh, attacked Greta. So women stepping up to lead, whether it's in their communities on the climate front or in politics, are going to face more harassment because of the overlays of sexism and you know if they have other identities too so it's important to create those opportunities and to ensure that they feel safe and um you know empowerment comes with with those risks so we need to make sure that society around them is embracing uh this you know gender equality and empowerment and that these the conditions are such that men and boys are bringing uh women and girls along too you know, I love what you said, that these young people are keeping us accountable because I'm hearing more often than, than not that our generation really messed things up. But, you know, it's up to the younger generations to fix it. And and I, I think it's the other way around, that we need to uh, empower them uh, and we need to fix it. We need to figure it out. But you recently ran for office in a seat that has never had a congresswoman. Why did you decide to run and, and what, what is your advice to other young women who um, are seeking something similar? So across political spaces in elected office, women are underrepresented, whether we're talking about the U.S. Congress, whether we're talking about, um, you know, parliaments across the world, whether we're talking about, you know, heads of state. But I ran as an epidemiologist, you know, I'm, we're in the midst of a global pandemic and COVID has shown us that, um, you know, epidemics are political. And you can have one of the wealthiest countries like the United States with the best doctors and nurses and hospitals with 5% of the population, but 25% of those who have died because of pure mismanagement. One of the early campaign um, sort of events that I did is I held an event with Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of Zealand, who now is leading the WHO's independent panel on COVID around women's leadership in COVID. And there we highlighted the fact that women like Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, or Angela Merkel in Germany, and women leaders across the globe have managed the COVID um, challenge much more effectively. And it's a generalization to say that, uh, you know, women, you know, outperform men every time, but there is something to be said about women leadership, uh, bringing a new perspective, maybe uh, a perspective where it's not a macho sort of approach to a crisis. You know, COVID is not a war. You can't beat it. You need solidarity. You need data. You need science. You need to bring in the right people. So the idea that, um, you know, I ran, uh, it was a four month campaign. It was last minute. I was, you know, it was great because there were other women running for office. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, it isn't, a woman didn't win this time around, but there was a lot of emphasis about what we brought to the race. And I think it's important for women to recognize that they should step up if they feel that they have something to offer and to know that they will face a lot of bias because uh, women running for political office um, have more hurdles to overcome. Hurdles, for example, of getting their tone right, you know, or what they wear or harassment online. You know, it's... It, you end up having to balance this too tough or too soft or, uh, you know, too academic versus too in the, you know, in the trenches. So I think women politicians have a lot of obstacles to go, but the only way to reach the parity that we want to see is to get more women elected so that our image of women leaders changes. And it's, you know, women leaders are as diverse as, as men leaders. Uh, we mm -hmm. just haven't gotten there quite yet. And, you know, earlier, um, Aya mentioned that the importance of female mentors and bosses and um, what role have they played in your career? Oh, a tremendous role. And I agree with everything that Aya said on, on mentorship. It is absolutely essential that women find the support they need. I think a lot, um, a lot of younger women, including myself in you know, my early 20s, you can be a high achiever, but oftentimes you question yourself or you... Um, you know, there, there's this term of imposter syndrome. You say, you know, should I be here? Do I have a space to claim here? And it's other women um, having claimed those spaces, but also having brought you under uh, their wing. And it's not that men can't be mentors, but in my career, I have had women like Helen Clark, you know, the prime minister of New Zealand, who even for this race, I texted with her and, you know, she was kind of behind the scenes telling me, you know, you have to do it. 
this is how difficult it is, but this is how you can do it. Women like Mary Bassett, the New York City Health Commissioner, who you know I was her science advisor, just being there along with me. But it's it's teachers, it's community members, but the mentorship part and the networking part is so important, and we should not underplay that. And until we have women leaders in all sectors, whether we're talking law or science or business and public sector, it will be harder for women to rise because the networks are just so strong um, that they, you know, it's hard to break into those. So. Um, I'm excited to take on that role as a mentor to young women who may want to run for office or scientists or academics who are thinking of you know, public service. So I hope to take that on. But we must also recognize that um, because so few women are in leadership positions, they often get called to you know, advise and mentor a much larger number of people. So it, it, it's, a, it's a burden on, on all sides, but it's so important. And it's incredible to have role models like you. I want to circle right back to Karishma Dami, and um, I want to introduce her. A young, she's a young student, and Karishma is currently a chemical engineer at the University of Surrey, and she's just completed a year in industry working for Air Product, a leading global industrial gas company. And at the end of this month, she'll be returning to study for a master's in the subject. Growing up, Karishma atten attended a small all-girls school where she was one of two girls studying math and physics. And she was shocked by this fact, so she created initiatives to encourage girls in the younger years to consider STEM careers. So with future aspirations to, pers uh, to pursue a technical role in the engineering section, she hopes to successfully boost the quality of life of people worldwide and to be at the forefront of green energy technology. It's always so incredibly wonderful to have young voices, people who are still, uh, you know, who have dreams and aspirations and are studying to, to, to accomplish their goals. And Karishma, let me ask you, how do you think more girls can be encouraged to pursue STEM subjects at school? Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Peggy. It's been, it's a privilege to be here alongside so many amazing women. But circling back to my question, so at school, I had fantastic teachers and they always believed in me and told me that I possessed the abilities to do whatever subject I wanted to in the future. And I think this encouragement for school children is so, so important. To choose chemical engineering at university was quite a daunting decision for me for two reasons. Firstly, none of my friends or peers were going to study engineering. And secondly, my learning environment was going to be completely turned on its head. So like you said, at my small school, I was used to studying along, alongside all girls because it was an all girls school. However, at university, obviously only a very small proportion of girls choose to study engineering. So in that situation, I would have been studying along mainly boys, which would be very different for me. And despite this, my teachers continue to believe and support me. And that kind of built my confidence in the end. And I believed I really could study engineering and go far with it. So my first point would be that teachers play a very big part in young children's decisions. They need to be able to inspire individuals and genuinely care about their futures. So like Aya and Natalie were saying, mentorship can be so, so helpful. And like them, I have been very, very fortunate in my life to have great female role models. So during my school years, um, I did recognize that I had to be a, a leader to the younger students because um, I had the first time experience of studying maths and sciences. So I decided to set up some initiatives to encourage younger girls. So, for example, I connected some of the younger years with the A-level students who are currently studying STEM subjects. And then they could kind of discuss um, what it was like to study those subjects at a higher level and the possible career um, progression that you could have with these subjects. And I also introduced a star scientists initiative. So every month, teachers would highlight students they think have excelled in the subject, and then they would be given prizes in assembly. And this really motivated and encouraged the girls to apply themselves in lesson time. And then, like you said, on my placement year, I became a fully accredited STEM ambassador um, and was able to represent the company at various STEM events um, around the UK. And I had the opportunity to speak to school children and discuss and bring upon the importance and how important subjects are and the role they play in our world today. 
And these networking events, like the um, like Natalie said, they're so imperative to be able to create connections and see people um, in those positions and the kind of work they do. So my second and final point would be that women, if women find themselves in the position to be role models, they should take that opportunity without question. It's great for young girls to see successful women excel in science-based subjects. It lets them know it's possible and attainable. And we play such an important role in inspiring the next generations and we have to be leaders. And in that sense, you certainly are a learning leader. Can you say a little bit more about being a learning leader? Sure, so I think to be a learning leader, you have to lead by example. So as long as you are continuously broadening your skills and knowledge, that makes you a good leader. So when the UK government announced the official lockdown in March, I really wanted to make good use of my time. So I immediately made a list of three goals I wanted to accomplish. And I think I ended up um, completing all of them. And one of them was to read at least three books. And I discovered a love for nonfiction books. I was just able to learn so much from them. And some of my favorites were The Happiness Track by Emma Sapali and A History of the World in 20, um, in the, of the World in 21 Women by Jenny Murray. And they're both fabulous books and extremely empowering. And they discuss some of the profound things that women have done to shape the current world we live in. And I wouldn't have been able to get this perspective. Um, obviously, I do an engineering degree, so it's not always focused on all the amazing things that women have been able to do and how they've been able to shape the world. So leaning out and doing this extra kind of reading really brought to the forefront for me how important women are and the great things they can achieve if they believe in themselves. And personally, I just think young people uh, should put a much higher importance on being learning leaders. So instead of sharing highly edited pictures on social media platforms to create kind of unreal expectations and unattainable girls, and I feel like this especially falls onto women, um, we, should have we should use these platforms in a completely different way. We can use them to share articles, interesting books that we've read, and just have really stimulating conversations. Rather than making people feel bad on social media, we can really use it to like show how women can be role models to each other and we can connect with people all across the globe. I think it could be so much more advantageous to young people um, to use this platform in a completely different way. And for this reason, I have recently started to kind of decrease my activity on social media because I just don't resonate with what it's trying to portray. And here's a woman who has completely paved her way uh, in innovation and uh, moving over to Carla Tanner, who's a um, um, entrepreneur and uh, founder of Future Argo Challenge, which is a global platform, as we said, that focuses on innovation from farm to fork. Carla, how do you move forward when everyone is telling you that your ideas don't work, can't work? So um, let me just give you a little story more about my life and the lessons learned about it. I think uh, sometimes just reminiscing of the past and understanding how I got here helps me mentor other people when I'm working with them. So as a kid, I was, I was good at many things, but I never excelled at one. So it was always hard to guide as to where I was going to go and what I was going to do. I graduated undecided. And while I went into university, I realized, you know, I was speaking to my dad. He said, you might as well do business because you'll be able to do everything. I didn't really understand what that meant and the potential of that. But then business was more business management and entrepreneurship was just one of those electives, you know, hidden in the catalog. Um, after graduating, I had to come back and work with the family um, and when I did so, you know, we were just a retail store and looking at it and doing, you know, the work of the family, I realized there was so much more potential for what we're doing. Uh, at the age of 20, I stepped up and I told everyone, you know, that I'm ready to take this to another level. And everyone looked at me, you at 20, you know, you're the youngest one here. What are you going to do? So I had to literally argue and, you know, make pave my way through even with my own family to say that I could do it and I will do it. And so I decided and, you know, luckily I was able to turn our retail store into a catering company. Um, it's, you know, it's, they, it's the ones that usually tell you that they can't are the ones that usually tend to drive you in the, that direction. And that's where I learned my first lesson. 
is that no one could turn your problems into opportunities except yourself. You know, you need to really find yourself at the start of your journey and your passion and not settle for less. And it's that self-determination that keeps you going. So after doing and turning the business around, I decided I wanted to step out and especially step out of family politics. So I, at this point, it was the Olympics that was happening in Athens and I took part of that and it was great, but it was just an experience then and I wanted to do something next. But because of all the international exposure, I decided that, you know, this is my time, maybe I should just travel. So I took a one-way ticket and I told everyone, I don't know when I'm coming back, I'll see you later. Upon return, I decided that I was going to start up my own events company, and I did. Um, and again, once I did that, I I was you know hesitant, and I was looking, and a lot of people told me, "Why don't you?" So I stepped back, and I said, "You know, maybe it's not time right to do so." So I ended up uh, you know looking for a job, and I worked in a I found a good job in a leading communications company, and within three days, I said, "I'm not doing." I said, this is not for me. I'm not going to do this. I need to do something else. I stepped out of there and I said, you know, my passion right now tells me I want to continue to travel and I'm going to travel. I need to work, but I'll figure it out. And a few days later, you know, I was speaking to a friend and coincidentally, she told me that there's this, um, this opportunity to be a hostess for a jet. So I was like, let's do it. Everyone looked at me like, what are you doing? Why would you be a hostess for a jet? And I said, you know, this is where I learned my second lesson, that every experience matters. And you need to learn from everything. And by doing this, I learned how important the impact of aviation industry had on crisis management. And that took me one step forward. And then after that, when I came back, I said, now it's time to open my events company. I did so. And I did so not having done an event in my past. But in order to do that, I had to really believe that I was going to do it. And I knew within me I could, but I just had to be that person doing it. So I stepped out the door, went to my first conference, and I said, you know what? I am the best event organizer there is. You should hire me and so forth. Okay, I got several failures, and that's okay. I had to step up to it. I knew that I was going to get those failures. But after a few jobs here and there, I didn't realize that I was going to leave myself to uh, – a royal family and I stepped up to the plate and I said hi you know this is my name I'm an event organizer and so forth and I ended up counting myself my first big event job there and you know when I was handing over my budget I said I really I don't know if I should be doing this but I just did they accepted it. and I then was when things really had to turn around and so finally I did and you know from then on things changed and I was doing really big events and so forth and that's when I learned my third lesson that you create who you are and you need to be the reality you want to be. So it's honestly, you know, to express yourself. But it's also important to know that if something doesn't, you know, you don't have to do something and be a prisoner for it forever. So I sold that and I moved on and realized that, you know, I wanted to do something that better expresses me in the world because events is fun. But there comes a limit where there's so much I could communicate with suppliers. There's so much I could communicate with, you know, my clients. I want more. I want bigger. So this is the point where I started Industry Disruptors, and it was really about innovation and you know where my passion, how we could solve problems, because that's what we really wanted to do. And then this was an opportunity when Greece was in a crisis in 2012. You know, my husband and then a partner of mine, we decided that you know this is a time where we really need to switch the mind shift, and you know, especially the youngsters. The youngsters here, you know, they have this public service mind shift, and we need to change it. We need to make people know that there's a possibility if they want to make a possibility. This is where unemployment was at 60 percent for the youth. So we started off this, uh, in the, you know, this organization which excelled, and later on, I realized that there was a big potential in agriculture, especially in 2015 when I became a mother. I realized that something is missing in this whole industry. And I was looking, you know, really for transfer of, you know, uh, transfer of knowledge from across. They didn't want to recreate the wheel, but then there was not much happening in the agricultural industry. It was more really about traditional NGO, uh, you know, ways of doing and supporting the agricultural industry. So then we started off our own initiative and within like, two or three years it grew and since then we're, we've been supported over 200 startups we've selected and supported you know we've we've invest supported startups to have, make more investments and even investors like by celebrities like Ashton Kutcher and others have invested in those startups so 
it was really the determination, I think, is the bottom line that got me to go where I'm going. So here's the million dollar question, Cla uh, Carla. How do you balance being a mother and a professional, an entrepreneur? How does, how does that work? You know, Peggy, I really, I cannot underestimate women. Women have the potential that, and they, I think the more you give, the more you prioritize. The more you do, somehow it all, the more, I don't know how it works, but somehow when I have more on my plate, I tend to do more. And I think it's just because that's where you really need to put a priority list forward and say, you know, this is what I'm not going to do and this is what I'm going to do. And then somehow it clears the pathway of doing it all. So I think that's, you know, maybe doing more is a trick. I'm in awe. Uh, very, very impressive. I want to move over to Bonnie Miller and uh, Professor Bonnie Miller, and who is a psychologist and a world traveler and who has been uh, to so many different countries. Uh, you've come across situations where young women didn't always have opportunity. Bonnie, I remember how passionate you were about supporting young women to have better lives. Can you tell us about this and how your work has fo focused on changing these situations for young women? Thank you, Peggy, and uh, my old friend we, uh, from we worked together 25 years ago at ACS um, when I was doing substance abuse prevention there. Um, I, uh, in this panel, I represent the multi-generational uh, perspective because uh, back in the 60s, uh, the expectations and the roles were very different. Um, I've, most of the women that I went to college with uh, were studying to be teachers or possibly social workers. Uh, everybody figured they would get married and either work or not work. And as, as far as I can remember, mentoring was not really out there. So over the last five decades, um, I've, I've seen great progress uh, here in developing and uh, developed countries uh, and and the progress that young women have made and how they've come forward and, and taken on leadership roles. Uh, I was fortunate enough when my husband was the head of Plan International to be able to visit um, over 40 developing countries and to work in some doing training on child abuse prevention and, and education. So um, being in the villages, talking with the women, um, I could uh, see that um, poverty and oppression were the main issues that were affecting girls and women there. Uh, the boys had better educational opportunities. The boys even had better nutrition. If there wasn't enough food to go around, the boys got more food, better food. The girls stayed home to take care of the younger children uh, or to walk miles and miles every day in the hot sun and, uh, and fetch water. So the boys could move ahead and the girls were stagnant kind of behind. Um, the girls were considered uh, and still are in, in a lot of sub-Saharan African countries and um, up until recently in places like uh, Afghanistan, India, we've seen as India's come out of um, a really poor country um, and has developed that, that women have had more opportunities. But girls in a lot of these countries were and still are um, considered property of their fathers uh, and then property of their husbands and not their own person. So um, th this was the situation and still is, unfortunately, although it is getting better in developing countries. Um, on the trafficking situation, um, I started in Bosnia-Herzegovina and also worked heavily on um, counter-trafficking in Greece. Uh, those two countries were destination countries. So in Greece, um, women would come there because they thought they could earn money, it was a better life. Bosnia was just coming out of their war, but there were a lot of international men there who could be clients, and so that's where the women wound up uh, being trafficked. I was fortunate to be able to have conversations with hundreds of women, mostly in Bosnia, um, some in Greece, but all over the world, 
uh, about how they happened to get in that situation. Many were from uh, Moldova, Romania, Ukraine, and like all girls of, of that generation, they had dreams, they had um, wishes to have a better life, to earn some money, uh, go back and, and share it with their families. A lot of these girls were put out there because uh, they were supporting family members who needed medical attention or um, uh, boys, their brothers who were getting the education and these girls were paying for their brother's education or they were mothers. So these girls were looking for a better life and looking for some money um, that could support that. And so they wound up uh, in Bosnia and in Greece. Uh, and a lot of what I did was public awareness to help people to understand that these girls were not paid prostitutes. These girls were sex slaves and they were not getting the money and they were not able to go back to their countries even. Um, so there was a lot of public awareness that I was doing both in Bosnia and in Greece um, to raise awareness about the plight of these women um, to do prevention. Um, uh, I worked with the consular sections of uh, all the countries who were sending these women, uh, where, you know, where the women came from, uh, uh, of how to do prevention campaigns in their countries so that the women could uh, recognize the deceit and the tricks that the traffickers used. Um, I did a lot of media interviews, a lot of uh, speaking at conferences. I created public service uh, announcements for awareness so that people could know that these women um, were poor and coming from difficult places and uh, were human beings. Uh, and then uh, I worked a lot on uh, protection, starting the first shelter in Greece and working with Doctors of the World, which is a wonderful NGO uh, that, that provided um, psychosocial support and medical support and help with repatriation. We also did um, lobbying for laws <clears throat> and policies. And I wrote, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the key sections of the Greek National Action Plan uh, to help uh, with this whole issue of the prevention, protection, and prosecution. I also trained judges and prosecutors in Greece to understand this phenomenon and see these women as human beings and prosecute the traffickers who are the, the true villains in this situation. I wanted to say two other things. One about mentoring. Um, I was fortunate uh, recently to be part of a wonderful project called Room to Read, their girls project. Um, they have uh, programs in eight different countries, seven in Asia, and they take these girls from sixth grade and mentor them all the way through 12th grade, make sure that they complete their education. The mentors are young women in their 20s who've been successful. And so my piece of it was training for the mentors to help these women working with the young girls and their families and to um, help them encourage education. But not only that, life skills like financial literacy, literacy wellness, problem solving. So this is an ongoing project, which is wonderful. And the last thing I wanted to say on this topic was about how girls are, are discriminated against uh, in other contexts. Uh, I was also fortunate in recent years to work with uh, an NGO called SEED, which is working in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, their clientele are the girls and women and families of ISIS victims. Um, as you remember, in 2014-15, ISIS swept into um, Sinjar in, um, in Iraq and killed many of the men, took uh, the boys as um, young cubs to be soldiers, but took the women and even teenage girls uh, as sex slaves. And so this project um, was uh, creating uh, programs to counsel these women. And my part of that was to create a, a six month training program for social workers and counselors who are working with these traumatized populations. Wow, Bonnie, amazing. 
amazing work, difficult work, and and so very very necessary. And um, just that, that just leads us to how important the legal system is in terms of you know working for these um, young women and others like them. But uh, going on to Ariel White, um, Ariel, tell us about your background and how easy or difficult to go into law as a profession has it been? Uh, what have been some of the challenges you faced as a woman? Sure, thank you, um, Dr. Polanis. I'll um, maybe take that in, in, in three sections. I'll start with my background and then I'll touch on um, sort of the, the challenges to get into the profession and then the challenges once you're in the profession. Um, so in terms of my background, um, um, after graduating from high school uh, in Athens, uh, ACS Athens, went to law school, as you had mentioned uh, in the intro. Um, and for me, education really was the, what opened doors for me. So my, my parents were the first um, and first generation in their families to finish high school, let alone go to university. Um, and for them, the university and, and for their education was the way that they sort of completely transformed coming from very humble backgrounds, both of them to uh, you know, becoming uh, a chemical engineer, actually, so charisma, uh, you're living my mother's dream for me, um, for my mom, but my father ended up um, uh, reading law, although he never practiced and became an entrepreneur. But um, they were able to completely transform um, their, their lives through, through education. So that's always been something that in my household was um, seen as a, as a key to unlocking uh, future potential. Um, and and really, I have to give a bit of a shout out to the IB program, um, and I'm you know kind of reliving it a little bit, not not only and thinking about having done it at ACS Athens because I've actually just signed my son up for uh, opted not to put him into the British system, but opted to, to sign him up to the IB program, which you can now do from the age of four um, here in the UK. And it really because I think it was such a great program because it taught us um, not only just sort of you know analytical thinking and having a diversified um, curriculum, but also to there were many sort of leadership opportunities. And I remember being president of the IB Council and, um, you know, that just taught me how to, 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 to lead projects and everything we had to do around community service, gave me opportunities to organize projects, organize teams and do something that was good for the community. And actually for me, it really kind of fired something inside me that I realized actually later in life um, was really what led me to, to, to where I am today. Um, and, and going to, 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 to university, I have to say the other thing here in the UK, which I think is one of the huge benefits is it's very accessible. So I, I went to law school, you know, virtually for free. Um, you have to pay some sort of some fees now, but they really pale in comparison to um, higher education fees in the United States. Um, and I was able to go to one of the best law schools in the country um, and 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 it wasn't a huge burden to my family. So I think accessibility to ed education as well is really really key. Um, and because I got good grades, uh, you know, I was able to get a training contract um, at one of the top law firms here, what we call Magic Circle Law Firms, and that really was what opened the door to me uh, for me for to, to to have more opportunity. Um, so really, education I think was was the, the basis and foundation of all of that. Um, after uh, training at Freshfields, I uh, spent uh, over 10 years at um, two large U.S. law firms, and I kind of had a bit of an existential moment uh, about a year or two ago, really. Um, you know, you know, after almost 15 years in the profession, um, working really hard and long hours, and I'll come, I'll come on to that when I speak about challenges. Um, I kind of felt that something was missing. So even though I was working at you know, some of the best law firms on the planet. I had just spent nine months in house, uh, you know, at a client's comment to Goldman Sachs. And I, you know, had all these great, you know, contacts and network and stuff, but something was really missing for me. And um, I said, well, you know, should I leave the legal professional together? Well, you know, what is it? And I think Carla hit on this when she was talking about it as well, is, is I was missing, I was missing, I was missing clarity around what my passion and what my drive was other than just getting the good grades or going to the top law school or going to the top um, law firm, what, what was it that was going to keep me going uh, beyond having achieved all of that? Um, and really, I, I, I realized it was wanting to have impact. And, and being a, a corporate lawyer, I said, okay, well, how can I have impact as a corporate lawyer? 
and realized that a big part of what I do, I mean, I focus on listing companies on the London Stock Exchange and then advising public companies once they're listed. But a big part of what I do is actually corporate governance. So there's, there's a G part of ESG. Um, so anything to do with how companies are, are run, their engagement with stakeholders, um, their regard for climate, their regard for regard for social issues, you know, how they're structured, you know, their board, uh, you know, diversity on the board, succession planning, all of that. So ESG and particularly the G matters. And I said, okay, well, I really want to do that. And I really want to, you know, find a platform where I can um, have more impact through that part of my practice and and also really look to the emerging markets and, and drawing on from my own my own diversity being half Greek and half African American. So well, I really wanted to focus on uh, the emerging markets of, of Africa and Greece and help emerging market com companies um, put robust uh, corporate governance frameworks in place so that they are better enabled to access the international investment community. So they are ready and more in and considered more investable by the international investment community. So I went away, wrote my business plan, and then decided to put myself out in the market and, and try to find a, a, a firm where I felt the, the platform to do all of that was, was, was better. And so about two months ago, I joined a, a global law firm called Brian Cave Leighton Paisner um, as a partner in the M&A and corporate finance team. Um, and I'm in the course of you know, building uh, and executing my business plan and, 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 and uh, achieving that dream. And for me, it was, it was um, you know, really quite, quite a, a moment and a, quite an achievement actually, because there are only 12 black female partners at top 20 law firms in London, UK qualified, and I'm, I'm number 11. Um, and the only one in the corporate finance space and the only one in the London office of my firm. Um, and not only, you know, I went back to what I really wanted to achieve was impact. And now I've, I'm even more, feel more empowered because of the platform I have at the moment, and particularly off the back of the Black uh, Lives Matter movement um, and everything that's happened this year, particularly in the African American community in the States. You know, I have an ability now to, to really kind of deliver on that impact and, and, and inspire others in the way I've, I think I've always really wanted to. And um, that was sort of really ignited in me um, at ACS Athens. In terms of um, getting into the legal profession and 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 surviving it, um, it I would say as a woman, you're probably it's quite easy in a way. We have more women, and I'll speak to the UK market because that's the one I know the best. But we have more women graduating from law school than men. We have more women uh, uh, enrolling for training contracts at your top law firms. Uh, pretty much all of the firms I've been at, our training contract, our training trainees uh, cohorts have been made up. If not 50-50, then slightly more skewed towards women, so 55-45. Um, what becomes problematic is once women progress. Progression is the issue for women in, in law, and um, it's not an entry point issue. It's a retention and progression um, uh, challenge for women. Um, and, and if you add the intersectionality um, bit of it, of maybe being from an ethnically diverse background, for example, which is something I've experienced in particular, that's even harder. So in the in the UK, for example, only 1% of partners, so well, we'll give a gender statistics first, where we've got about an industry average of about 18% of partners are female, um, but 1% of partners are black. And a fraction of those, I've just told you, there's 12 of us in London, there's one in Manchester, so 13 in the UK are women. So, so, so it's, you know, once you add gender into together with um, other um, diversity factors, it becomes increasingly challenging in, in the legal profession. And I know a lot of the panel has really spoken a lot about mentorship, but for me, I think what's even more important than mentorship is sponsorship. And there's a difference between the two. Um, Sponsor, a sponsor is someone who's within your organization, who can advocate for you, who sits at that table where decisions are made and who can advocate for you when you're not in the room. And women in particular, I think, and, and um, you know, intersectional women as well, so ethnically diverse uh, women as well, I think suffer in particular from a lack of sponsorship uh, in the legal profession. And, and that's something in particular I'm, I'm pretty focused on and, and trying to look for opportunities for us to make sure that not only we as women are better about sponsoring each other, um, um, which I think is a whole different conversation in and of itself, but um, that 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 men and allies are also um, very focused on um, doing what they can to, to sponsor, you know, really talented women in their organization and make sure that they, you know, they come up um, through the ranks. Um, in terms of some of the ch challenges, 
Um, yeah, <laughs> I've faced a number of them. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I think the key one is always that I've been. I've been different. I've been. I've been the outsider. And you know, I'm totally cool with being biracial today, and uh, you know, both Greek and 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 American, and I feel genuinely both. Um, you know, it's, it's it's you know, it was a learning um, exercise for me to become comfortable even in my own skin. And in terms of other differences, I didn't go to school here in the UK. I didn't attend Oxbridge like a lot of people do who end up at the top law firms. Um, you know, I have an American accent um, even after 20 years in the UK. Um, and that makes me diff it makes me difficult to place me socioeconomically, which is um, how the system works a little bit here. Um, I'm non-British, uh, and pretty much every room I go into, if I'm not the only woman, I'm certainly one of few, and I'm, in most cases, the only person of color, um, certainly black. Um, and I think probably as a woman, one of the biggest challenges I faced was um, I had a I had a little boy three years ago, so I was quite senior in in my career, and I was sort of really kind of trying to climb the ladder to become partner, and um, and I think coming back from maternity leave, and I ended up joining a new firm, you know, during during maternity leave, and stepping into a new role at the time was counsel. That was really really challenging. It was really challenging to come back into a super male dominated environment to have the pressure of trying to progress and, and really break that glass ceiling that only 18% of women have managed to to do to break into um, and to do that whilst trying to you know still be a mum and breastfeed at the same time I mean it was really really challenging um, but um, I think what helped what, what sort of helped me through it and the advice I would give to those behind me um, is is you know really be clear and you know think about what drives you what 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 is what is your motivator and once i kind of thought about that a little bit more and realized that achieving my dream would also enable you know there, there are others who have come before me who have paved the road before me to shatter glass ceilings to break down barriers and some you know many fell in and along the way in trying to do so um but what they tried to do is is make you know reduce the number of barriers and glass ceilings that I faced. And, and I felt, you know, if I were able to achieve my dream of becoming partner, um, that, that, that would kind of honor those who've come before me and that I would not only be achieving my own dream, but I'd be achieving, you know, the dreams of others and what others wanted for me. And, and so I think once my mission kind of became a little bit more than just something that was about me and my own personal achievement, but was more something about the community and what it would mean for, you know, black students to see, uh, or, you know, black female students at university to see a black female partner at, you know, a really top law firm. Um, that gave me an extra drive and an extra, um, um, you know, energy and, 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 ability to really persevere through some of the challenges and accept um you know that that you know being different was you know in some ways made things harder but also you know taught me how to reframe um the way i was looking at things and 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 use it also to to my advantage and bring it into to my work and the way i've tried to do um through my business plan so you know i i think in terms of um you know i've certainly stumbled along the ways but i think you know I always look back, you know, think about what my father used to say is whenever you fall off the horse, um, the most important thing to do is to get back on. Wow. Thank you, Ariel, for that. And I know as we're, I wish I had so much more time to talk with each of you. There, these, you're all such inspiring young women and uh, experienced women. But if we had the opportunity in a very, in a very succinct sentence, if we had the opportunity to be at the United Nations right now, what is one thing that you would like them the, them to hear from you? Very succinct. Anyone jump in? So, I'd like to jump in. I'd like to. There's one thing I can say to remind everybody that if you help one woman, you're not just helping one woman. You're helping her family, you're helping the future generation, you're helping her kids, and you're helping her community. And women are the pillar of uh, society. Uh, they're the mothers, uh, they're the heart of the family, uh, and they're the inspiration. They create, um, you know, if, if we talk about a male-dominated world, 
Uh, it's women who create these men. Uh, it's women who can shape these men, and it's women who can inspire these men. So if there's anything I can uh, say is uh, when you're helping one woman, you're helping more than just one woman. And that's I, it. I can happy to add on to that and just say that once you reach the top the top floor, uh, and, and I'm speaking to women in particular as well, you know, send the elevator right back down. Um, you know, for me, that's true leadership um, and true, true excellence. Um, and I firmly believe that the might of your power is greatest when you share it. Um, to that, I agree. Um, it's important, you know, that women also realize that it's okay to fail. There's a lot of weight on our plate to succeed, and we have a lot of barriers ahead of us, but failure will be part of the process, and we need to know that's okay. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of women don't realize their potential, and uh, as as mentors, um, and especially with you on this panel, the uh, young women who are maybe mentoring younger women uh, can help them uh, look further in their goals and realize their goals, and also impart uh, to their children that they can achieve too, male and female. And I'll just add the, the work-life balance when you have a family. I have three-year-old twins and a seven-year-old, and I did run for office, and you can do it if you have the support network, uh, but it is difficult. So just recognize that um, you know the, the conversation is hard when you're deciding when and how to have a family if you want to have a family, but as long as you can bring people along with you, there are ways to, to get around it, but don't underestimate the challenges. Wonderful, excellent. Thank you all so much for being here today. And I know that uh, people watching from around the world will be so inspired by these conversations. And I hope to see you again in the near future. Congratulations for all that you're doing and how you're moving uh, you know, in your particular areas uh, ahead. And, uh, Thank you again for being, being part of this panel. Take care. Thank you.